City Cast from Explicity. When landscape becomes woman. I was eight when I looked through a keyhole and saw my mother in the drawing room in her hibiscus silk sari, her fingers slender around a glass of iced cola. And I grew suddenly shy for not having seen her before. I knew her well, of course, serene undulation of blue mulmul, wrist serrated by thin gold bangle, the gentle convexity of mole on upper right arm, and her high arched feet, better than I knew myself. And I knew her voice like running water, ice cubes in cola. But through the keyhole at the grown-up party, she was no longer geography. She seemed to know how to incline her neck, just when to sip her swirly drink, and she understood the language of baritone voices and lacquered nails and words like emergency. I could have watched her all night. And that's how I discovered that keyholes always reveal more than doorways, that a chink in a wall is all you need to tumble into a parallel universe. That mothers are women. Spirituality, what is it? There is no easy definition of spirituality. There certainly is no dictionary definition of it. So I decided to make sport of finding out how different people define spirituality. But every explanation I encountered was merely another shade of grey. No one could really honestly define it. Maybe we will examine the etymology of the word later in this podcast, but I suspect that spirituality should be seen not merely as a word, but rather felt as something that ranges from the metaphysical to the paranormal. My guest today, Arundhati Subramaniam, has embarked on a more difficult mission, writing about it. As an award-winning poet and a writer of rather succinct and evocative prose, she offers us a window into her lasting and perhaps growing sense of spirituality. Arundhati's ability to write on this undefinable subject is an impressive skill, a skill that enables her to corral the many wayward strands of spirituality into something that we can all understand and maybe relate to, introspection. In this episode, I dive into finding out how Arundhati brings grammar and craft to her definition. I also dive into something else that has mystified me. What's poetry? I'm going to ask her. Arundhati Subramaniam, welcome to the Literary City. Thank you, Ramji. Happy to be here. First, congratulations on the Sahitya Award. Thank you. Feel good about it? I think I do. I know I do. But the thing about awards, and some of them in particular, is that they, that they make you feel that this otherwise somewhat invisible art of poetry, poetry being more invisible than most other literary forms, or every other literary form, that is actually audible. Now, I know that you don't write just to win awards, But here's a question I ask many of my guests. Why do you write? Good question. And particularly when it comes to poetry, I think that's a question one asks oneself fairly often. Royalty tips are few and far between. And publishers are scarce. And uh, readers are few and far between. Because almost everyone has written a poem by the age of 16, but not everyone goes out there and buys a book of poetry. This is a paradox about poetry. Yeah, so really no practical, no pragmatic reason to be doing it. So why does one do it? Not because one is a stickler for punishment, but I guess, Ramji, because somewhere no other literary engagement, at least for me, comes close to giving me the sense of aliveness and uh, and pleasure that poetry does. But you did say that that polygon has another face. I'm very fond of quoting this uh, American market research survey that I read about at some point, which claimed that poets die sooner than other species of writer. Of their own free will? Well, that part of it has still to be investigated. But the point is that it's a, it's 
you know, legendarily a self-destructive form, you know, meant for neurotic people. That's the, those are all the old stereotypes, right, about poetry? They are, indeed. But now speaking of your prose, I would like to quote these two examples of your writing that stood out for me as particularly skillful prose. The first from a magazine article where you describe your feelings about the Tibetan concept of bardo, that time between death and rebirth. You wrote... I have long been fascinated by commas rather than full stops. And then this delightful take on gravity, something that we never think about. And I quote, Imagine the planet lurching and pitching in a galactic tempest. Pots and pans, furniture and microwaves, loved ones and livelihoods are flying around the room. (laughs) Delightful. Where, may I ask, did you learn to write like this? You know, it must have to do, I'm not sure I'm going to be able to answer this uh, satisfactorily, but let me say that initially what drew me to even poetry was essentially an excitement, a kind of uh, sensual excitement about language. You know, just hanging around words, uh, feeling the texture and the grain of words, the taste of words, the fact that you could leap from one place to the other, particularly in poetry, without joining the dots, that you could uh, play with language. You know, I think that kind of exuberance and sensuality of language was essentially what drew me. Well, actually, my question relates more to the craft Mm -hmm. of, uh, of how you write it and what were your literary influences that led you up to this point. You know what, let me toss one out there, purely for the sheer economy of your prose. Hemingway? Oh. <laughs> well, I mean, I've done my share of Hemingway, reading Hemingway, but I'm very glad, Ramji, that you're talking craft, because that's not something that one gets to talk about often enough. True. And far too many conversations end up being about content. And craft is not a dirty word at all in my book, and I'm glad to see it's not in yours. It's not. Because... Uh, not at all. I believe that it just leads to a kind of self-conscious writing, and I don't think that's true at all. So I think if I were to answer this uh, to the best of my ability now, we'll come to influences in a minute, but I think it is in fact my uh, love of poetry that compels me to approach language with a particular kind of rigor and economy, because economy is really the mainstay of poetry. And perhaps it is that, that makes one look for, you look for the right word, you look for the precise word, but you don't allow yourself the superfluous word. You read that out. Speaking of craft, you have some rather interesting literary devices that you use. Uh, Let me read you a few words that you have used. Lyric lines, verse tracks, leaf song, star song, bird call, and swan flight. Now, these are two different separate words that you've made into one word. Now, uh, what literary device is this? It's not portmanteau words, nor are they blends. They're more like compound words. So is this more a matter of bringing poetry into prose? I guess. I'm so glad you asked that because not everyone uh, notices that sort of thing. And I'd say I really, this is what I would do in a poem, Ramji. So that's why it's there. prose. And those were moments in otherwise in uh, passages that are otherwise just conversational. I needed to, my way of texturing language is always about in some way allowing myself um, the lyric moment. Mm -hmm. And those are for me lyric moments in the prose paragraphs. Lyric poetry, to me, lyric poetry is poems that can easily be set to song. Is that what it means? Yeah. So there is definitely the kind of uh, lyric poem I'm talking about is not the lyric alone, not the lyric that, not, not a song. Okay. But there is musical element to the lyric poem. That's very, very strong. So the mu- it would be poetry in which the musical element is strong. Music and sound, I gather. In your book, Women Who Wear Only Themselves, you speak of Balarishi's chant as libation. So is sound an important part of poetry for you? Very. It's integral. By what methods does one capture sound in poetry? I mean, I know onomatopoeia is one. T.S. Eliot used it. You did read a lot of Eliot, didn't you? I did, yes. It, it sort of shows, I don't know why. But nonetheless, back to the question, how do you believe that sound is captured in verse? I mean, the most obvious device which all poetry uses is alliteration, isn't it? So for me, I would 
workshop a few days ago and I was just telling the participants that for me, the, the sound of desolation, for instance, if I were to think desolation right now, the word, the, the sound that would come to mind for me is Coleridge, alone, alone, all, all alone, alone on a wide, wide sea. And I've often asked myself, why do I think of those lines? And I realize it is alliteration and the sound of that sea you know, the L sound giving me a sense of the lapping of those waves, that is the reason why I associate the two. So these are, this is just one example of many in which poets find ways, I think, of, uh, and sometimes instinctively, because they've just spent so long with their craft, and sometimes more consciously, they find ways in which um, they, oh, an entire mood um, is distilled through sound. I was reading Aga Shahid Ali, a poet whom I enjoy a great deal. And in his Ghazal, which is a lament about, you know, it's a lament for Arabic. And if you were to just hear it on, just on the level of sound, it creates that mood of loss and elegy perfectly. But if you were to actually read it line by line, each line makes sense and it's highly nuanced. But it could work purely on the level of sound as well. So is uh, spoken verse as important as written verse for you? Yes, yes. So are there any yes. Arundhati Subramaniam audio books out there then? I perhaps need to start thinking of that, Ramji. It's something I've been uh, toying. You write prose enviably well. At what point did you decide that it was going to be poetry and not prose? I, th I think I was almost always certain that I would be doing poetry over fiction. Fiction was never going to be on the agenda. And why not? Because poetry does for me what fiction doesn't. It's a particular kind of very intense, very distilled, very heightened engagement with reality. And prose to me, and fiction has wonderful seductions, you know, but it just uh, engages with time in a way that doesn't excite me as much. The way in which the lyric poem compels you to inhabit this moment fully, deeply, completely, that excites me. We spoke of low entry barriers and everyone's a poet and so on. But let me ask you, what is the measure of skill in poetry? What do you mean by the measure of skill? How can you tell good poetry from bad? Ah, so I'd say there are some criteria that usually work, but they're not written in stone because as soon as you do, there will be some verbal organism that will come along and challenge that definition. But I'd say the, some, some of the criteria you look for, or I look for in a, in a poem, often poetry works through metaphor, it works through image. So whenever there is an image that is strong, almost always it will communicate more deeply and it will endure in, in the listener's uh, memory much more than a statement will. So I'd say image is important to me in a poem, sound is important to me in a poem, Tone is important to me in a poem. Tone is the axis, your emotional axis in a poem. Economy is important in a poem. And finally, I'd say surprise. The po a poem does something that is unexpected always. And so along with image and sound and tone and economy, there is surprise. To swing the pendulum to, a, to the lighter side, tell me about nonsense verse. Who's your favorite? I enjoyed Lear, I think, Edward Lear. Ogden Nash? Yes, absolutely. You know, it was, it was great. It was fun. It was playful. But there are various ways of being playful, and nonsense verse is one way of doing it. Ever tried it? Have I tried what? Nonsense verse? Well, any funny poetry, actually. Oh, yeah. Absolutely. I, there are... Which book? Well, Love Without a Story is the most recent one, which was published in 2019. But there is a poem in there that's called A Song for Catabolic Women which is a fun poem. Cool. Read it for us now. Okay, I will. So we had Arundhati Subramaniam record this poem for us, and we're going to play it right now. Song for Catabolic Women We're bound for the ocean and a largesse of sky. We're not looking for the truth or living a lie. We're coming apart, we're going downhill. The fury's almost done, we've had our fill. We're passionate, ironic, angelic, demonic. Clairvoyant, rational, wildly Indian, anti-national. We're not trying to make our peace, not itching for a fight. And we don't need your shade, and we don't need your light. We know charisma isn't contagious, and most rules are egregious. 
We're catabolic women. We've known the refuge of human arms, the comfort of bathroom floors. We've stormed out of rooms, thrown open the doors. We've figured the tricks to turn rage into celebration. We know why the oldest god dances at every cremation. We've kissed in the rose garden, been the bells of the ball, hidden under bed covers, and we've stood tall. We're not interested in camouflage or self-revelation, not looking for a bargain or an invitation. We are capable of stillness even as we gallivant, capable of wisdom even as we rant. Look into our eyes, you'll see we're almost through. We can be kind, but we're not really thinking of you. We don't remember names and we don't do Sudoku. We are losing EQ and IQ, forgetting to say please and thank you. We are catabolic women. We've never ticked the right boxes, never filled out the form. Our dharma is tepid, our politics lukewarm. We've had enough of earnestness and indignation, but still keep the faith in conversation. We are wily Easterners enough to argue nirvana and bhakti, talk yin and yang, shiva and shakti. When we are denied a visa, we fall back on astral travel, and when samsara gets intense, we simply unravel. We are unbuilding now, unperpetuating, unfortifying, disintegrating. We are caterwauling, catastrophic, shambolic, cataclysmic, catabolic women. It is both funny and delightful. Now to move on to uh, matter spiritual in your book, Women Who Wear Only Themselves, uh, part of your quest for spirituality, it occurs to me that you could have been a chapter in that book. Possibly. Tell us how. Because I've had a journey of my own, and in some ways this is a book about travelers, fellow travelers. So it's possible I could have been there. I'm not sure I'm ready to put myself in there myself. By referring to your quest for spirituality, I meant that while the book is about these different women, it's also about mm -hmm. you as an integral part of the whole thing. It's a construct, but it's a you construct. Would I be fair in saying that? absolutely fair because this is not in this does not claim to be the biography of any of these four women what it is is a conversation and a conversation involves mutuality so i needed in some way to implicate where i was coming from mm -hmm. on the divine end of the spectrum of spirituality i have a question when in literature did we stop teasing the gods teasing yeah the early writers okay. appear to have had a rather easy relationship with their gods. You know, they belittle them, drag them down, tease yeah. them, mock them, Absolutely. right? Well, what happened to all that? Where did it go? It hasn't gone. I hope it never goes. I think we need to keep reminding ourselves of those traditions. I think what has happened, and if that's what you're also alluding to, what is something we've lost, I'd agree with you. Okay. We, we seem to take offense all the time today. We certainly do. We've become gatekeepers of our gods. And we've forgotten that there has been a wonderful tradition of uh, ridiculing them and sometimes, uh, um, you know, berating them and throwing tantrums, uh, you know, around them, but never ceasing to love them. That is, for me, the, the joy of bhakti poetry, that we're capable of doing all of this, but we still love our gods, you know. And uh, the same Tukaram, who's able to tell his God, you know, I've had enough of you, he's able to actually say, after yearning for his God endlessly, is actually also able to say, I've had enough of you. That's the kind of liberty you can take because this is such an intimate relationship. As I said in the beginning of this uh, podcast, I couldn't find a dictionary definition for spirituality. Is it one of those, I'll know it when I see it kind of things? I think, yes, it is something to do about, with... Uh, you'll know it when you experience it sort of thing. And there's really no one who doesn't know it. It's just that, uh, you know, it's almost as difficult to define as love. But we've all known it. You, know? you have to deal with all of this as a writer. So it has to be a sort of must-know, must-find thing for you. So what is it? Does it start with questions on life and death and then spiral outwards? Or where is the epicenter of all this? You know, I... For me, as a writer, it's not like I sat down and said, I'm going to put on some hat. That's my spirituality. Reasonably so. It happened simply because I was asking myself certain questions. Those questions led me to certain places. Those questions led me to certain places within myself. And uh, that necessitated writing in a particular way. 
So sometimes when I look back at my writing, Ramji, I feel I've actually been writing about the same things. You know, it's just the how that has changed. Writing about the same things has also included more than one reference to your skepticism. So I'm curious as to uh, that expression of skepticism. Is it important? Is it central to what you're trying to do in terms of communicating and connecting with your readers? I have questions. I've always had questions along the way. And for me, you know, if I were to fine tune what I said earlier about now the need not to be, I, I don't see it as gullibility or skepticism. I'd say in any case, I don't think of skepticism as a dirty word either, any more than I think of craft as a dirty word. But I do have a problem with cynicism. And I do have a problem with, uh, you know, I'm uncomfortable around a constant, uh, an attitude of constant suspicion. So I've been through my share of doubts. Those doubts, as I say, have only shape-shifted. They haven't gone away. I still have my doubts. And that's been an integral part of my relationship with my guru, for example. And it's not like it's a state of complete weak need, veneration, and surrender. That's not been the relationship. But it's definitely curiosity and a need to know and um, a value that I would place on a particular kind of knowing that keeps this um, quest alive. So what is Arundhati Subramaniam's next quest? You know, I know you're going to the Maldives, the JLF uh, Soneva Fushi edition, and you are going to be reading your poems on a sunset cruise. How magical that seems. Am I? So I imagine. Oh, sounds wonderful, okay. doesn't that it? Sounds wonderful. Now that sounds like a <laughs> spiritual experience to me. Do you know what you're going to be reading? Well, I knew that I was going to be reading on a deck. I didn't know it, I was on a cruise, but that sounds even better. Maybe I romanticized it and made it a cruise. Now that I've said it, you must insist to them that it's a cruise. So yes, there is going to be... It sounds like a fabulous place to have a lit fest, doesn't it? I mean, I'm kind of excited. As you should. Yeah. So you're looking forward so, to it? Very much. I've been to, uh, to the Maldives once, and I knew I wanted to go back. And I can't think of a better way to go back, you know, with a lit, with a lit fest. And, uh, and if there is going to be poetry on a boat, that sounds utterly perfect. Now, I'm sure that Sanjoy Roy is listening to this. So uh, he, all he has to do is to find a boat and deliver a sunset. <laughs> what are you doing next after that? What's your, what's your next project? I, I don't know, Ramji. I'm, you know, dealing with multiple things. I don't know where they will head. There are individual poems happening. And uh, I've also been reading a lot of uh, Indian women mystics. So the possibility of actually putting that together in an anthology, that's another possibility. But it will all take time and uh, I'm not in a hurry. And I hope that your many fans will take kindly to your not being in a hurry. Arundhati Subramaniam, it was absolutely wonderful to have you on The Literary City. Thank you so much for being my guest today. Thank you. Thank you, Ramji. Uh, I feel we actually covered a lot of terrain. I'm pleased you think so. And see you before long. Look forward to that. Arundhati Subramaniam wrote a fascinating poem titled The Dark Night of Kitchen Sinks. And she will be reading it for us at the very end of this episode. So stay tuned. And I'll be back with that very popular segment, What's That Word?, where we look at words and phrases that we use all the time but never stop to think about. And I'm back with What's That Word? And to help me with it is my co-host. And as always, I will let her introduce herself. Hi, my name is Pranipi, but you can call me P. That's P with an A, not another E. And hello, P with an A. Say, have you ever written any poetry? Of course I have. Who hasn't? Well then, recite me a composition. Yeah, right. With Arundhati Subramaniam and the entire literary world listening. Oh, forget them. What do they know? <laughs> well, what about you? You don't seem like the poet type. That's true. I have been accused of being somewhat prosaic. <laughs> hey, but listen, do limericks count? Yes, of course. Do one now. No thinking. Oh, man. But I do love limericks challenges such as this. All right, let's see. Mm, okay, here goes. There was a young lady named P who would spell out her name with one E. Her efforts at diction 
weren't matters of fiction nor a stray quirk of philology. <laughs> That's always amusing. Okay, you have won Limerick competitions, haven't you? In London and Cheltenham pubs, no less. Well, I'll admit the competition was always incoherent, blotto, pie-eyed, you know, drunk. <laughs> well, who was not incoherent was Arundhati Subramaniam. Super articulate. All right, P with an A, what's the word? I know you tried to commit us to spiritual, but I am drawn to another word you used. Okay, which one? Portmanteau. Oh yes, portmanteau. Okay, shall we dive into it? Let's do it. All right, let's start with some trivia first. Did you know that the first use of the word portmanteau in literary fashion was by Humpty Dumpty? Uh, through the looking glass? Yes, very good. In 1871, Lewis Carroll had Mr. Dumpty from Through the Looking Glass explain the words Slithy and Mimsy from that amazing poem Jabberwocky. You see, Dumpty said, it's like a portmanteau. There are two meanings packed into one word. The reference to packing comes from the French meaning of portmanteau. The two words port and manteau, port means to carry, manteau means overcoat or suit, but really that's a suitcase. So right. he likened it to uh, the two halves of a suitcase. So when closed, make up a full suitcase. Portmanteau, right? Yeah. Now let me give you some examples of portmanteau words. The easiest ones are brunch and motel. I don't have to explain those, do I? No. And then there are these. Bollywood, which is Bombay plus Hollywood. Biopic, which is biographical picture. Botox, which is botulism and toxin. And closer to home, internet, podcast, webinar, and uh, say, rom-com. Ah, rom-com. Is there a portmanteau for Netflix and chill? Netflix and chill? I have no idea. But seeing as how you're a big fan of the portmanteau, I guess you could Netflix and... Uh, let me guess. Chillax? You got it. That's where I was going. Netflix and Chillax, the portmanteau. Oh, God. Not a fan of the Chillax, eh? Yeah. A warning to stray dudes out there. If you ever suggest we Netflix and Chillax, you'll never see me again. <laughs> Poor guys. All right. That's scary. Well, I guess you could kiss them. Ew. I just said the opposite. Oh, I know. I was making up a new portmanteau. It is kick plus ass. Get it? Kick plus ass. Kiss. <laughs> well, if I had a dollar for every time I wanted to do that. Well, may your dance card never be empty, P with an A. <laughs> Heading back to the definition then. So, Arundhati Subramaniam's conjoined words are not portmanteau. No. And you said they aren't blend words. No, they aren't. So, you said they're compound words. So, dish on the difference. Right. Okay. The difference between portmanteau words, blend words, and compound words then. All right. It really is a waste of time trying to nuance portmanteau from blend. They're pretty much the same. Well, at least let me tell you, they aren't substantially different. But, you know, saying mm -hmm. portmanteau is more elegant and it covers you with a pattern of intellect. I'd rather say portmanteau than blend. Anyway, they both use parts of words to create a neologism or a new word. But compound words are such that two different whole words are mushed together to create a compound word. So Arundhati's compound words are that. Example, swan, plus flight, she combined those two words into swan flight. And that's the whole story. Right. So I suppose now all I need is a snappy exit line. Um, you know, any good portmanteau goodbyes? No, I don't. But I think you just uttered a compound word. Which? Goodbye. <laughs> okay, I'll live with that for this week. Okay, P with an A. Uh, just be careful about what words you use in your compound, especially when you Netflix and chillax. <laughs> that was fun. Let's do it again next week. And 
to close out this week, here is Arundhati Subramaniam. She reads from what I think is one of her best poems ever. The Dark Night of Kitchen Sinks I know you, of course, your familiar swamp of grease and indignity, knives and spoons scattered like mutilated limbs across a battlefield of gravy-streaked plates and wounded china. After the civilities of supper, I've heard the Huns of cutlery. Who hasn't? Unleashing their true selves. Jostle, raid, ravish, slump. And I recognize you. Just another kitchen sink. Dreaming of foam and equanimity. Another lifetime and we'll get there, I promise. Creamy, lavender-scented, pH-balanced. For now, your dreams smell of detergent and mine of love. It could be enough. Enough.